What's up, brand builders? Stephen Hurahan here on the Brand Master Podcast. And in this episode, I'm speaking with Emily Cohn, creative consultant, coach, and author of the hugely popular book, Brutally Honest, No Bullshit Business Strategies to Evolve Your Creative Business. Now, Emily has an absolute passion for speaking with creatives and strategists about evolving their businesses with easy to implement strategies. And that's exactly what she serves up for us in the Brand Master Podcast today. In our chat, Emily shares her valuable wisdom on how to demonstrate your value to clients, how to raise your rates in modern competitive markets, and an excellent strategy to get more business and revenue from existing clients. So if you want to learn techniques that Emily shares with her coaching clients to get better clients for your business, charge more for your work, and involve your branding business, then don't miss this episode of the Brand Master Podcast. Welcome to the Brand Master Podcast, show specialized in helping branding professionals and entrepreneurs to build brands using strategy, psychology, and creative thinking. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brand Master Podcast. And I'm absolutely delighted to have Miss Emily Cohen on with me today. Emily, thank you so much for taking the time to join us on the Brand Master Podcast today. Thanks very much. I'm excited to talk to you and share some stuff and, you know, hear your questions. So yeah. You. Now, now, anyone who doesn't know Emily, I would imagine a lot of uh, people listening to this podcast, uh, you know, come from a creative background. They've heard of Emily Cohn before and her amazing book, Brutally Honest, No Bullshit Strategies to Evolve Your Creative Business. And I was just talking to Emily before we hit record and I jumped onto eBay to look for a copy of this book and to get a physical copy of this book, it's running at $550 or something like that because <laughs> yeah. it's a beautifully printed book. I, I wish I had it here to, to show you. And obviously the supply and demand is really pushing up that price. Emily, oh, there, there, there it is. There you go. Beautiful. What, <laughs> so why, you do you think it's, like... why do you think there's a black market on, on this book? Well, because it was limited to printing. It was mm. only I printed 4,000 copies, it, um, and I decided not to publish it again. And so there is very few copies out there, and everybody wants the book. So it's pretty funny. It's actually that price is on Amazon, too, and it's not just one seller. It's on yeah. sellers. I don't yeah. know. If they get that price, that's amazing. But <laughs> uh, Yeah, just, uh, I mean, let it go at this stage. It's going to be a yeah. collector's item going forward. And, uh, you know, as, as I said to you before, it's, you know, you've in, inadvertently created that Air Jordan limited edition strategy. So <laughs> kudos to you. Um, now we're, I, I've got tons of questions for you here. We'll get Great. through as, as many as possible. Um, and the first thing I want to jump into is, you know, directly from your book, you, you mentioned within your book that clients are like children. And I, I absolutely love that for many different yeah. reasons with my experiences. And you, you do mention that they need rules in place. They need praise and encouragement and structure yeah. what what do these things look like in practice with your client on on a day-to-day -day basis to really manage that relationship yeah it's actually one of my favorite quotes in the book and everybody quotes it so it's pretty funny and yeah. actually i think it says dogs and dogs and children yeah. uh, <laughs> it does. you were very polite and didn't say dogs um, i know it's <laughs> it's really about People behave better when they know what the rules are and what the boundaries are. And so it's with clients, you have to give them those boundaries and that structure. And that's mm -hmm. in different ways. Like I'm a big believer in onboarding documents mm -hmm. to new clients. Yep. You give onboarding documents to staff, hopefully. You mm -hmm. should do the same with clients. Here's how we like to work. Here's how we'd like to communicate or discuss those with the client. Like, how do you like the communication? Because it's always about communication. That's always the issue. Do they, you know, slap you? Do they text you? Do they email you? You know, where does this information go? So just having the rules of engagement. Mm. A lot of designers just kind of fly by the seat of their pants. But the other thing I think is, is not allowing, um, is making sure that you have a clear scope of work and contractual documents, mm. right? So yes. a lot of times, I see these proposals and they're beautifully designed and they have all these great case studies and it's all about the client, but it's very little about what we're going to provide, the parameters of what we're going to provide and what's included in the fee. I always find like designers trying to leave it open-ended mm -hmm. um, and that's not good. Clients need to know, okay, I get three concepts, I get two rounds of revisions. So, and actually having contractual terms that are readable, right? So that are in friendly terms that the client wants to read that don't, they don't just sign and say, oh, I didn't read that, I didn't see that. So instead they've read it, 
you've explained it to them, you've reviewed it, and there's structures in place, and they understood it originally. So it's about listening to them. And I have this expression, um, I'm a real big believer in, and I, it kind of, it's the answer to all my, my questions I'm asked, which is just build the love, right? If the clients adore I love you, I love you that. know, it's like with kids. Mm. I always say this with kids, like, yeah. kids are never going to stop loving you, mm. you know, unless you, you're a terrible parent. But, you know, if you're a decent parent, you give them the rules, they're not going to stop hating you. They might dislike you for a little bit, but they're going to come back and love you. And if you mm. build the love with clients, they'll forgive you if things happen. And mm. so I think spending more time building the love, and that doesn't mean like uh, being a pushover, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. It means just being showing your value and, you know, making sure the clients trust and value you and love you. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I really love that because I'm a firm believer in relationship building and really approaching your business yes. from the most basic human level, from everything from, uh, you know, empathy and understanding and yeah. asking questions and making them feel that that you actually want to know who they are. So I, I really yeah. like that, uh, you know, in, in kind of building that love and, and setting out your boundaries, yeah. just like children, you give them the sandbox to play in and they know the rules. So the relationship yeah. is going to be so much fuller and more rewarding for both of you. So, you know, exactly. I, I, I think that's a, um, I, I really yeah. think that's, that's a beautiful approach. Um, yeah. Now, I would say the one thing is with, with relationship building, some people equate that to people pleasing. Those are two different things. So yes. building love is building love is very different than than just people pleasing. Right? So, so how would you? So let's say you wanted to build the love with a client, and you want to to really build up that relationship. Yeah. But you get you're starting to get a little bit of pushback. How do you find the balance there? Is it is it through the onboarding document and those original? boundaries it's, or it's actually before that yeah i'm sorry did i interrupt you yeah it's kind of the, before that it's like even before the proposal mm. it's really spending more time with because what happens a lot of times is creatives are just so excited that a client has called them mm. <laughs> they have like an hour <laughs> I kick off that. Off. yeah like oh a client called me or oh, this project's exciting or oh it's a good big budget or something designers always fall in love with something um and then what happens is they sort of do like an hour kickoff call, maybe like a half hour meeting, but they don't really spend time asking good questions and, and meeting them in person or as much as possible, really spending time talking with people. I really still, I know it's really hard right now to build pe meet people in person, but as much as you can meet your clients in person, they'll mm. adore you more and asking personal questions about their lives, not getting too deep, but mm. you know, making sure that they've had a good day. If you know, they're going to a trade show, ask how the trade show was. So it's, it's like at the new business process is making sure yeah. that they know you're paying attention to their lives and their, and their world, their world. Mm. Yeah. And I, I really like the onboarding side of things as well. We, we tend yeah. to bury a lot of our terms and conditions, uh, you know, in, uh, you know, in, in those formal documents. And if, yeah. if you're able to, uh, you know, to, to dress something up in a, a nice, warm and yeah. friendly way, but still put your boundaries in place, I think that's a really nice way to do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We just have all these legal garbly, godly gook that no one wants to read. Mm. If you just write in plain English, this is what this clause means. This is what this clause means, you yeah. know? And, we, yeah. and I think the other thing is reviewing that with them. And so you can make they, a play... Yeah, you can make a playful as well, you know, you yeah, know, be nice. We're 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 all on the same team kind of kind yeah, of thing. So, exactly. so I really like that. Now, we 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 do we are in this place. Now, a, a lot of uh people listening to this are in the transition from being just a kind of order taker uh yeah. creative into more strategic services and even back when we specifically talk about execution services, there is a lack of understanding of the value of yeah. the those design services. And that's found, you know, in this day and age, in the strategic side of things, because there's such an education gap, there's such a misunderstanding there about yeah. what a brand is and the value of strategy. What are your go-to principles to demonstrate the value in what we do as creatives yeah. and as strategists from, you know, that early discovery phase. Yeah. Now, I think I talk about that a lot in my book that a lot of firms are either executional or strategic, but they're somewhere in between. And you have to kind of decide which one because you can't be both. 
Mm. And so when I talk about being strategic, it means, right, first having a team in place that no matter what they do, they're advisory to clients. They're not order takers. Mm. They have um, power or are enabled to talk or empowered to talk to clients and teach them and educate them. So part mm. of it's having the right staff, no matter mm. what they, even like people right out of college, if they have an expertise or they have a passion for something, they should be able to show that. But I think the best way to show value is two things. One, I think it's our industry responsibility. I think all the associations for designers need, need to do a better job of, ex, of demonstrating our value at a business level, speaking mm. at business schools, you know, making sure we have metrics of success for our industry overall. Mm. And then at, a, at an individual firm level, it's about really solid success metrics. Designers put out testimonials, like client testimonials. Oh, they were so much fun to work with. You know, we adored them or they really solved our problems. No one cares about that stuff. Mm. What they really care about is how did you move the needle? Mm. What percentage of increase of viewers did the site have? Did it increase sales at the, you know, on the, I don't know, at the store? Did it, you know, increase self shelf presence? Did it, you know, so there's a lot of metrics we can capture mm. that we don't. Yeah. And I think we as an industry need to do a much better job of, and, and at an individual level, capturing, like asking a client at the big, and I know we're going to talk about this later about good questions to ask, but um, it's really about asking the client, what, how do you measure success? Mm. Right. So we understand that. And then we can call them back and say, how did that work? Yeah. You know, how did you measure success? And then we can be advisory. And this goes back to strategic. If they say, we don't know how to measure success, you can say, well, we're an expert in your industry. And here's how our other clients have measured success. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. yeah. And especially, especially within branding, because branding is, it's, it's soft. It's fluffy yeah. around the edges. It's hard to quantify. And I, I, I often compare branding to, again, going back to the human side of things, building your relationships. You know, you can build a friendship over time. And then when, you know, you ask somebody to do you a favor, they're right on that. And, and you know, they respond straight away because you've been putting, you know, time and effort and, you know, and friendship in the bank. So it's, it's there for you to draw on. It's right. very difficult to quantify that with friendships. You know, why is it that they returned the favor or that they, they, they did a favor for me? You know, was it, was it, you know, that we had them over for dinner? Was it that we went out for drinks? Was it that conversation we had before? It's very hard to quantify that because that's very fluffy. So on the branding side of things, it, it is more difficult and we, we do need to do a better job at that. Yeah. But any, any metrics you can grab from the digital marketing side of things yeah. that can tie into what you're doing from, you know, traffic to conversions to sales, right. they all help. And if you're able to benchmark from the very beginning and then come back later on and, and you know, you're keeping that relationship going with your client, yeah. that's where you're able to take those metrics and you know, attribute the success of those metrics to the work that you do, did before. Yeah. I would also say that branding, while it's not clearly, it's a little, like you said, fluffy, I do think there's other contributing metrics that you could take credit for. Like mm -hmm. if it was rebranded, if even Chris, even after it increased sales, after rebranding, you, you, you had a contribution to it, for that, yes. so you can take credit for it. Yes. So I think branding still has an effect, especially you have before and after case studies mm -hmm. of what the brand was like before and what happened after, Yeah. right? So I do think we can capture some of that more. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's also about increased press. You know, yep. there's a lot of press around rebranding or around, you know, so if they've increased press because the branding is so gorgeous or because mm -hmm. it's so much more on target, that yep. is some, a measurement of success as well. So I do think you can get that. Yeah. And I think it, the more we educate ourselves uh, on the valuable metrics uh, that move the needle in businesses, the more yeah. we can retrospectively go back to our clients that we've worked with and just just touch base with them just keep that relationship going how are things going you know and yeah, exactly. if they happen to mention oh things are going great sales are up then you can take the time out to say 
let's have a let's have a deeper chat about this yeah. and go deeper on those questions in terms of getting those metrics about yeah. their traffic and their sales and their revenues and things like that. And then you can feed that into your case study. So yeah. I, I really I really like that. And those metrics are are super important. Yeah. Um, exactly. Now you you mentioned in your book as well that you you don't like to make assumptions. And I think assumptions, yeah. uh, you know, they they yeah. they can they can derail anybody. But instead, you prefer to ask great questions. So, what yeah. are your favorite questions to ask from discovery all the way through to delivery? That that entire yeah. relationship. What are your f- favorite questions that you think have the most impact? Um, there's so many. I think obviously the one I mentioned already is with the very beginning of the relationship is. Um, what are your success metrics? Mm. So how do you measure success? And then the big question is when, and then putting it in your calendar. So I think a lot of times we don't, we ask only if they mention things, I actually like to ask it up front. So that's the thing. And I also love to do pre-mortems, which is at the very start of a project, asking them questions like, what do you think could go wrong? (laughs) What are your greatest concerns? Right. Um, what are potential obstacles? What are your greatest yeah. fears? I think if we ask those questions, like a, not a postmortem, but a premortem, yeah, we could really respond to that and say, or be, or adjust our process. Say, okay, if your greatest fear is this, like you have a lot of stakeholders and you're yeah. worried about, you know, getting everybody's buy-in. Let's build a process where we can build everybody's buy-in. Mm. What does that look like? Let's adjust our s- services and our scope of work to make sure that we have an all hands on deck meeting so we can present to the board or whatever. So I think it's around um, asking, you know, what their fears are. And I don't mm. think we do that enough because we're afraid to hear those answers, right? Yeah. So I think those are really great questions. And throughout the process, it's really about listening to, mm. not just asking questions. But And I guess the one thing I would say about questions, although I have so many questions I would like to ask, um, <laughs> is there's no, I think there, we're so fearful of asking too many questions. To me, yeah. there's no such thing as too many questions. Mm. Um, I think you could co- always hop on an email or hop on a call and just say, I had one more question, you know, just to get, they really do appreciate it. Mm. And you'll get signals if you ask too many questions. Um, I think it's obviously, to me, a lot of it's around stakeholders, like who's involved in the project and what their role is. Mm. Um, And not just taking their word for it. So for instance, you're working for a nonprofit and they say, oh, you're just going to work with me. And you should ask, because you know, nonprofits have board of directors or board of advisory. I'm like, you should really ask if the board's involved. Mm. You know, you've had these problems in the past. Make sure you are clear to the client. Is this person involved? Is the CMO involved? Like refer back to your own experience with other clients of those industries to kind of use that information to ask smart questions. Mm. Um, I think the other thing is around feedback is giving them guide rails for evaluation and feedback. So my question is a lot of times when I'm giving initial concepts or another round of revisions is I give them a guide rail of like five questions that they should answer. Like, mm. did this solve your problem? Yeah. Is the typographic hierarchy correct? So I think it's around not just giving them presentations and saying, is this approved? But telling them this is what you're supposed to approve mm. and this is what you're not supposed to approve. And that's through questions. Yeah. Right? And, and- I, I really like the devil's advocate approach uh, to, to what you said before, because sometimes yeah. your questions, if if you just run through the same questions all the time, it can kind of feel robotic and, and the client can get the feeling that, you know, you're just running them through this process and, you know, you do this, this with, with everyone. And if, if yeah. you throw in a question that's a, a little like devil's advocate that they're, they're not kind of expecting um, it, it just, it kind of builds the relationship a bit more that you're prepared to go there because you want to explore all these right. different avenues to make sure that you're the right fit. So it actually, it, it it's kind of counterintuitive, but it, it actually works yeah. to build that relationship rather than push them away. And I, I guess it's a, it's a kind of litmus test. Um, so, yeah, uh, exactly. so, so I, I really like that, uh, that devil yeah. advocate approach. Um, yeah. Now I mentioned to you uh, before, Emily, that we, we've got a lot of, uh, listeners who are moving from the area that that we both love, which is the creative design space, to more uh, strategic side of things. And even in your your book, you're not just all about the creative. You do also talk about strategy. What's the most effective way for designers to move away from that executional 
kind of order taker kind of work to strategic work where they're steering the ship and they're pushing the, the project forward. Right. So I did mention, like, I think that you have to ensure your team is not, mm. that they're all advisory and they're not reactionary. I mm. think it's really about stop executing what the client wants and just ask for and really be more advisory and telling them what you think they need. Um, I think a lot of times we just do what the client says, mm. I need this and you don't think they need that. Or, mm -hmm. you know, so I think to me, it's around really having great conversations and being much more consultative and advisory and less responsive and reactionary and less like, yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. You know, mm. like really listening to what they need and saying, Here's other ways of solving this problem. Um, yes. So I think that is definitely one that is really helpful. The other thing is a lot of times the, the kind of clients we're working through, working with, have come through the word of mouth network, right? Through all yeah. our efforts, you know, so it's all around these people calling you and then you responding. So to me, it's for you to go after and get those better clients, mm -hmm. right? Because it's really hard to change existing relationships or existing patterns of behavior. If you're known for being a service-oriented firm, then you're going to keep that reputation unless you start seeking other people, out, other clients out and building a yep. new reputation. So Absolutely. to me, it's around new business also is really deciding where you stand, who you are, what mm. you value, what your, your specialization positioning is, and then going after those clients. And when I say go after, I don't mean sales. I mean, it's like relationship building. Right? Yeah. So just meeting and communicating with people that you want to work for that do value design and do value your mind and your strategy and not just your, you know, you doing what they ask you to do. Mm. So I think it's around all of that stuff and learning to say no more. <laughs> I don't think we say no enough. Yeah. Um, I think it's about letting, giving space in our workload to be able to take on the clients we want to take on mm. and to really just learn to say no. And so that's around qualifying our clients better. Yep. And asking those questions. So this is all, these all things all related, right? You, you yeah. really need to have the parameters of the relationship, ask the good questions, qualify them better, mm. you know, build the love. Those are really kind of, really kind of basic stuff that most people kind of forget. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think even before you start asking those questions, you have to get a little bit clear on, you know, what you would say no to and what you're only going to yeah. say yes to. Because if you don't actually take the time to figure that out yourself, you end up just taking on every single job that comes your way because yeah. you're not clear on your boundaries. Exactly. Um, and, and for anybody who is transitioning into a strategy and you're not ready yet to take that kind of advisory role and kind of give that advice, a, a nice way to ease into it is just become curious and take the position that, well, I don't know anything and I'm going to ask a ton of questions to make sure that by the end of this conversation, yeah. I know everything I need to know. So if you take the, the role of curiosity, it kind of takes the pressure off being a, a consultant or being an advisor. Yeah. And at the same time, you build that relationship because they feel heard, they have a platform to speak. And sometimes you know, we don't get that platform and we, 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 you know, we circle everything up here and right. it, it just gives them a great platform. So just yeah. becoming curious is, is, uh, is a good way to transition into the, the advisory side of things. If you're not immediately yeah. confident in jumping into that. Yeah. I think um, that's a little, I, I think that could be a little tricky in that you have to really be smartly curious rather mm -hmm. than just ask questions that maybe aren't less informed and show you that you're new to this thing. So yeah. it, to me, it's around maybe doing enough research that you can ask smart questions yeah. um, and also specializing. If you know your industry that you're working for, mm. um, if you know both the horizontal and vertical markets, you can come off curious, but as an expert at the same time. Yeah. Like, so you might not know their business specifically, but you know their industry. Mm -hmm. And that really helps a lot. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm definitely a big proponent of having your your ace questions up your sleeve your strategic questions so you can dance around them yeah. yeah. and you know do that little dance but but when you're ready and when you've built yeah. them up enough trust you place those strategic questions to you know to to open up the conversation and to get them to to kind of shift their thinking a little yeah. bit especially if they're all about the logo and all about the visuals and you want to guide them down that strategic road yeah. now you, you, you talk there about specialization yeah and you know, like 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 most people within the space. I mean, it's it's no secret. We're we're all talking about it. Specialization 
is is absolutely yeah. key and and you know to to be a jack of all trades it's it's the best way to kind of blend in what are your go-to factors when you go to 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 think or you advise somebody you advise a creative on on go and choose your specialization what are your go-to factors in deciding where that area of specialization should be yeah well first of all just embrace that specialization is the answer to many of your problems i think yeah. a lot of times we want to <laughs> We, like you just said, we want to be all things to all people. And yep. also creatives are curious. So going back mm. to that, we're curious. They feel like, and legitimately so, that they can design anything, right? But clients don't understand that. So they, under, they need to know you specialize. They need to know you understand their industry. And there's a lot of benefits for that, which I don't need to go into. But one of them is money, right? The more, you make more money if you specialize. Yep. Um, and it's also really hard to stand out in a very saturated market. And the only way to do that is to specialize. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I would say my process for helping my clients, and I'm doing this a lot right now. Actually, I have like seven engagements where I'm helping them just focus on their specialization. Mm. And we are going step by step. We literally first tell look me, at- Tell me about your step by step <laughs> process. I'm curious. I mean, it's kind of an obvious step, but no one does this, which the first step is to look at all the work you've done for the last three years. Okay. And see what are the commonalities, what are the common themes and, and, mm -hmm. and areas of what I first look at is vertical is, is the vertical markets, industries, right? Um, what industries have you done work in and doing a pros and cons list? Like what's great about those industries and what's not? And when I say pros and cons, I'm like looking deeply. So mm. not just saying restaurants, but maybe upscale rest luxury restaurants versus, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, fast food or a fast casual, like what kinds of places do you work at, um, work with? I'm sorry, not work at. And so first, it's, it's an evaluation of your current state. Yep. Who do you work for now? And what do you love about it? What are the potential problems? Then it's kind of dream big, mm. right? So the next step to me is like, who do you want to work for? What kinds of industries do you love? Do you mm. know a lot about? I actually also ask my clients, what's going on personally? Because we have these in our personal lives, we have communities that we don't leverage enough. 100%. You know, so I have this story where I had a client who was on the side, he was a tattoo artist. He also was a BMXer. And one other thing, I can't remember what it was because back then it was, you know, can't remember that way. But what we realized is that what he could specialize is in um, subculture. Yeah. Because he, his whole, all his friends, all his people were in the subculture. So why not specialize in subculture? You know, yeah. I had another client that was a big hiker and biker and, you know, knew a lot about like all of that. So why not go after the outdoor space? So part of it's leveraging the community we already have. Yeah. And seeing if there's something there. Um, mm. Because I think we, we travel in circles and those people can be leveraged in mm -hmm. ways, in mm -hmm. a, an authentic way, right? So first it's looking current state, then it's looking at the dream state. And then kind of looking at a competitive audit, who else is in these spaces? Yeah. What are the common themes? And then I also look at services. So I do the same thing. What are the current services? Where do we want to go in the future? Yeah. And then I also look at, so there's the vertical, then there's the vertical, which is industry, horizontal, which is services. And then I also look at um, what your differentiators are, what makes you really unique. And I try to yeah. find like two or three things that are going to add that little flavor, that mm. differentiator. And it might be culture, it might be past leadership experience, it might be a sense of, you know, a, a tone of voice or, you know, one of my clients is kind of this very sarcastic, uh, kind of irreverent kind of, kind of person. And the whole mm. firm is like that, they, it drives them. So why not call themselves irreverent? Because that's what they are, yeah. right? So I think it's owning who we are and thinking like deeply what makes us different. But designers have a tendency to specialize by saying, you know, we're just really creative. They use these kind of generic words of mm. like, we're, we provide memorable experiences or, you know, all this stuff. And what you really need to do is focus less on those things and more on, mm. we do this for these people. Yeah. You know, and really just answering that. We do this for this people and maybe then, and here's what makes us different or yeah. how this is how we do it. Yeah. And so that's kind of my process. It's very step-by-step step it's week by week we do it small increments so they can really think about it in between each each kind of consultative ex session so i really make them because i don't want them to make quick decisions a mm. lot of my clients in the past had made quick decisions about who they were 
Yeah. And they didn't do enough research. They didn't do enough thinking. And so I ended up having them land in places they didn't want to land on. So mm. now I'm realizing it's a much slower process. So they yeah. can really think deeply about, is this the right, is this the right fit for me? Yeah. And a lot of times it, it's stuff you, you knew all along, but you mm. just never said. Mm. Mm. And, and this is why I, I absolutely love strategy because everything you have just said are, are things that are uh, in, in some way, shape or form part of my process, although I would use different language for different areas, but it's all about getting to the center point of, you know, what, what's your relevance and relevance is something that I use a lot. And I, and you touched yeah. on it mostly with the community side of things to leverage the community. What circles do you, do you move in? And this can, uh, you know, you, you can pull so much value from, from finding your relevance because it's within your relevance that you're able to connect and resonate with people in a way that others can't because you understand them. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, if you're able to get to that point and, and then leverage that, leverage your relevance and then put something unique in with the, the way you do it, the experience that you provide, right. then, then you're onto something. Um, so, yeah, so a, a lot of people struggle with the idea of speci specialization because they think they have to choose uh, you know, a, a certain industry and, and they have to close the door to the rest of the world. But really, when you open the door to uh, specialization, there are so many different doors, so many different cross sections to, to find what's unique about you and the way you can deliver it to them. So I, I love your process yeah. and, and, and the steps that you go through there. Yeah, it's, and I don't, um, I don't think specialization means saying no to other kinds of projects. No. For me, specialization, and you can land on your page, what I think on your website, what I think specialization does, it gives us a way to go after and focus our new business or our, our relationship building efforts. So mm -hmm. a lot of times people don't build, don't go after new business or don't uh, build relationships because they do all things, all people, and they don't know who to go after. Yeah. So if you could just say, I love this industry, I'm going to start with this industry. And you don't have to say, I'm not going to work with any other industries. I'm not mm -hmm. telling you to do that. I'm saying at least she has two or three kind of specializations, industries particularly that I love that you can go after because those those people gather in all kinds of places right so mm. i was just at a conference in the south of um the us and i'll never forget i was at a design conference speaking and this was just a few weeks ago and there was another another conference there of snipers like so, so i'm now telling people if there's is there if there's a conference of snipers there's wow. gonna be a conference for everything and you just need to Meet, meet those people at those conferences and at that associations and at trade shows and at those yeah. meetups, right? So to me, specialization is less about picking, putting a stake in the ground mm. and first starting with just who do I want to work for? I want to meet these people. I want to build relationships. I want to learn about those industries. Where do I go? Yeah. And it gives you, yeah. it gives you fo focus and direction. Yeah. And I've heard you say this before, like you like reading lots of books that are not related to marketing and branding and applying uh, what you've learned from that into into your world of marketing and branding and creative, yeah. because you 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 get to learn so much more about other circles and and other types of people that you didn't previously know before, and it, it just opens up all different areas to connect and resonate with a certain type of people. So so yeah. I really love that as well. Yeah. Now you uh, you live by the principle of pricing high and working less. I love yeah. it. <laughs> uh, I think we all aspire to that. If if you were competing in the the design market now, that's very commoditized. How would you go yeah. about raising your rates? First of all, I think it's confidence. I think we all kind of always question ourselves, particularly women. Um, mm. So I think we need to get over that a little bit. So it's a shift in mindset and just building more confidence in ourselves and um, being comfortable asking for higher prices. Mm -hmm. It's saying no more. You know, because I think what has happened, I, oh, I have this talk that I give at conferences, it's called, it's your fault. And I think mm -hmm. the reason, and because I blame the industry for a lot of our problems. And, uh, yeah. and I think we are accepting, especially after, during COVID, we ex ex uh, accepted reduced budgets. And now those budgets are never going to go up. No. Just like after 9-11, budgets went down. Mm-hmm. And they never went back up. So first of it, it's making sure that you stand your ground mm -hmm. and be confident and ask for the numbers that you know you deserve 
and through your success metrics, you can prove, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's about specializing. I think the more we specialize, the higher we can charge. Mm -hmm. uh, it's avoiding any discussion of hourly rates. We're not a pair of hands. We don't charge hourly. So yeah. many of us still charge hourly. That's kind of crazy to me. Um, it shouldn't be about that. Um, I think also what I love about this moment in time, I absolutely love this, is this, there's so much transparency in our industry now. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and so every, all these, there's so many Slack channels of principles of design firms uh, and so many meetups of people just talking and sharing their numbers. So yeah. to me, it's really about sharing your numbers with your peers, not hiding them mm -hmm. and really level setting our prices as an industry overall. Yeah. So to me, this whole idea of pricing is an industry problem mm -hmm. and an individual problem. Um, so I think it's around specializing. It's better qualifying clients. It's asking for the numbers we deserve and not being afraid to know that you're going to not always win these things. And you might have to say no to some things. Mm. And I think designers have, a, they're so fearful of losing projects or saying no that they, they lower their prices just to, you know, win projects. Yeah. Um, and that you have to know that sometimes you're going to, you're going to lose some projects and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And again, right. it's, it's um, about knowing those boundaries. It's about knowing yeah. what you're, what you should say no to so that you're yeah. not, you don't end up saying yes to everything because we've all been there and we've done those jobs where you're like, you know, you're, you're a few weeks into it and you, you're already in the hole, you're losing money and, and yeah. you just regret taking them on. And, and, you know, a lot of the time that happens in a place where those boundaries haven't been set yet, you know, usually early on in, in the, the yeah. freelance career, but that can go unchecked for many, many years. Um, so it's, it's really important to, uh, to have those, uh, those boundaries in place. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I absolutely love and I'm fascinated about are marketing mechanics and uh, you know, the mechanics of funnels. And, and although you don't talk about funnels, you do promote the idea of upselling your clients to other services, yes. which, mm -hmm. yep. you know, is part of the value ladder and, uh, yep. you know, lifetime value of a client. What are your favorite techniques to do this, to upsell to your clients to bigger and better services or just more yeah. of, of what you've done? Yeah. Today? So at first, I don't love the word upsell because it feels very icky, yep. right? It feels like inauthentic. So I think yep. the first thing is just, I like to say, just be advisory to your clients. I kind of change the wording a little bit mm -hmm. is to accept that the fact is your job is to be consultative and advisory and ask, ask those small questions and give them advice and recommend solutions that you think they haven't thought of, but not in a way that's, just selling them services that they don't need, really honestly selling them services they do need. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it means that you have to demonstrate that value, demonstrate that need by developing some concepts on your own. Now, I'm not saying to do spec work on the client's request, but sometimes you need to say, I have this idea and I'm going to show it to you, but you don't own the rights for it. But if you love it, then we could really develop it and do something with this. And then you can have the rights to it if you pay me. Mm. So a lot of times, sometimes we have to actually... And I'm not trying to promote doing pitch work or spec work. That's different. That's clients telling you to do the work. I'm saying for you, once in a while, if it's a client that you think is not getting what you need to, what you are recommending, you might develop some concepts just to show them. Here's what the package might look like if we did if different looks and feels for each of the SKUs, you mm -hmm. know, or something like that. So I think sometimes we have to demonstrate what we're trying to sell them on. Yeah. And also the other thing is making sure that, um, you're upselling the right services, not just like site maintenance. To me, that brings you back to being an execution firm, right? So, yeah. you know, like for branding, it's very much less about like developing the little stuff, like an email blast here and there mm. and giving them, selling them brand guidelines. A lot of, a lot of brands don't ask for branding guidelines. Mm -hmm. And so part of it is saying the, why we need brand guidelines and how the value, what that value is mm. um, and upselling brand guidelines if you have to. And I, my favorite, my favorite way to do this is um, strategy summits, what I call strategy summits, which is at the end of the relationship, actually at the beginning of the relationship times, I offer as part of the package or as a separate offering to meet with them once a quarter or once every other quarter. But I usually like say to once a quarter, I will provide an hour of my time. I will meet with you and your marketing team or whatever team is working on the project to say, I just want to look at, especially with branding, 
how everything's going. Yeah. What are your plans for the next coming quarter? Yeah. And I could provide you advice about what things maybe you're not thinking about and having an outside perspective. So mm-hmm. saying, what's the strategy for the upcoming sum- sum- quarter and how can I help you? And yeah. so, and that's a new business opportunity to reconnect with the client every quarter. And yeah. so I often will say, upsell your clients a strategy summit, which means you meet with them once a quarter yeah. to understand what their needs were, what worked, what didn't work, and where are they going now? And maybe advising them how their marketing initiatives you know, might evolve and grow yeah. based on your expertise and then offering that as a service. Uh, saying, I, I can I, help you with that. I love that. Anyone listening, if if you're in your car, then you can't take notes, make a mental note of it. If you're sitting at your desk, write it down because these quarterly uh, uh, meetings, they they give the the client this sense of comfort and this sense of guidance that yeah. you're not just going to abandon them. You're going to be exactly. holding their hand through the, 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 the coming year. And that... Yeah that's that's nearly a no-brainer for them but it's also an opportunity for you to look at what they're doing and then to discuss other opportunities to create new business so it's like it's like you're selling four more sessions for you to get business out of four more sessions of course you're guiding your clients but it just keeps you top of mind and it keeps that relationship going so yeah no it's strategy summits love it yep love it you can call it whatever you want i have another point that yeah yeah. and, and that's it package it up yeah. in 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 a way that that adds that value perception strategy summits is yeah. um is emily's steal it steal yeah. strategy summits <laughs> <laughs> yeah. now uh, i i could keep going all day with this but i'm i'm not going to do that I've, I've got one more question for you um okay and, yeah and then i'll let you go about your uh, your day in your experience what is the biggest mistake that creatives strategists agency owners make when they're trying to build a branding business and instead of that mistake what should they do instead oh let's see i think the biggest mistake that they make is they usually launch their own firm for the wrong reasons Mm. (laughs) so they want creative control they want to not work with crazy people they you know they want all these things but they don't have business skills i hear this Mm -hmm. all the time well i don't have business skills so the first thing they do is hire either. There's two things that they do. This is a staffing thing. Um, and these are the biggest mistakes. Is hiring somebody that does new business. To me, that is a biggest no-no. And it, in my 30 years of doing this, I will say it very rarely, like 1% chance works that that person will bring in enough income to warrant their salary. Yeah. Um, and nobody wants to be sold to. They want relationship building, which is the owner, the principal's or mm-hmm. the partner's responsibility. So the first thing I think the biggest mistake is hiring either a salesperson or the other thing they often do is hire a project manager. So they hire people to do the stuff they don't want to do when really that's the stuff they should be doing and yeah. they should be letting go of creative. Yeah. And I know that's really hard for me to say to mm-hmm. my clients who are all fantastic designers, Yeah. but they should be creative directors, absolutely. But that mm. hands-on stuff, that is such a waste of your time. And that is not what an owner of a firm does. If you want to design for a living, go get a job. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I love know. that. And it, it speaks to my philosophy as well. And, and what I aspire to do every day is to move away from top of the funnel, uh, you know, uh, the, the outside of, of the, the mechanics of the business, the operations, yep. more to the bottom of the funnel where you can actually move the needle in your business and have more of an impact. So it's, exactly. uh, it, 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 that definitely resonates with me. Um, yeah. Emily, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I've, Thanks for as having I said, me. I, I could go all day and no doubt uh, you would be able to continue to, to drop value bombs. Um, I'm going to keep an eye on that uh, limited edition book and see how far it actually goes uh, with, <laughs> in terms with of price. interest. Um, I might yeah. buy it now as an investment instead yeah. of crypto. It might uh, it might take off and I can sell it at a profit later on. But um, but yeah, it, it, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure. If you do want to buy uh, the book, you can. Uh, you don't have to fork out the five fifty. You can get an ebook version of it. Yeah. Um, where can they get that? And where can they get in touch? That's with just you? On, you can get it on my um, all my links to my social and on my website. So it's emilycohen.com and there's a there'll be a link to um the you know the comment to buy my book um yep. but wait a month because i'm getting a new brand so 
Ooh. Don't order the book yet. Wait, then you can see my new brand. But uh, <laughs> it's available now and you can get it. Absolutely. Well, this will be dropping in a couple of weeks. So you might only have That'll to wait a, a, a couple of weeks. But uh, yeah. I, I would say try and get on Emily's uh, mailing list and uh, yeah. no doubt you'll get notified. Emily, as yeah, I said, exactly. it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join us. And you're welcome. Uh, I, I hope to chat to you again in the future about everything that you're doing. Thanks for having me. It was really fun. I always love talking to people that are in our industry and sharing best practices. So Beautiful. Thank you yeah. again. Thanks, Thanks very much. We really hope you enjoyed today's episode. Thanks so much for listening. If you want to learn more brand strategy techniques to level up your skills, make sure you check out brandmasteracademy.com. There's plenty of free resources and premium content for you to download and get you going. If you'd like to join our Facebook group full of like-minded brand strategists, all learning from each other, then find us by searching for the Brand Strategy Community, where you can find exclusive content for members as well. If you enjoyed this content, please be sure to give us an honest review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listened. And make sure you tune in for the next episode of the Brand Master Podcast. <laughs>